Hi, how's it going today? Thank you for joining me, John Wood, uh, in the show I like to call The Woodblock. I think it's clever, anyway. Uh, you know, one of the things that gets me, you guys, if you know me, and if you've seen some of the old clips I put up, you know that I talk quite a bit about politics, and I, I tend to think that our politics today are uh, a bit dysfunctional. I know I'm the only person who thinks that, but uh, forgive me for, for that sentiment. But uh, what you notice about politics is the same thing I think we notice about economics, and of course the two are, are related. People tend to have their own rigid ideological views about how things should work in that respect, and tend not to be able to see the value in what one side or the other side proposes. Uh, the danger in that, of course, is that we don't get anything done, but it also skews our understanding of history. So let me, let me try and give my, hopefully, not terribly ideological uh, understanding of what we should be doing economically, what we're not doing, what has and hasn't worked in the past in different historical contexts, uh, etc. Yeah. Now, start to start with the progressive view of how we should tackle our economic uh, crises, and I'm including within that uh, our debacle with the debt and the deficit. Uh, if you take people who are very hard on the left and, and do what they say we should do, uh, that is to say, ratchet up government spending, raise taxes, at least on, on the wealthy class, you know, top one or two percent or so. Uh, we could pay for our exorbitant expenditures through increased tax dollars from people making uh, significant amounts of money, and uh, through the targeted application of government spending, uh, ratchet up uh, productivity, economic uh, activity, so on and so forth. Uh, we essentially tried that with the stimulus package, and after roughly $800 billion spent, uh, that purchased us, I guess, about three or so million jobs over the course of uh, a few years, a uh, trillion dollars in, in new uh, deficit spending, uh, roughly five trillion dollars in new debt, and uh, essentially an anemic rate of growth after that. Not terribly impressive. On the other, on the other hand, uh, you have conservatives who would say, well, just flatten the tax rates out as much as possible, uh, slash government spending as much as possible, and you'll have a recipe for growth and fiscal solvency. And while there's some wisdom in that, it should probably be, probably be noted that when you cut taxes a lot, you still increase the debt, you still increase the deficit significantly, at least in the short term. And when you cut spending, there are areas uh, that you're cutting, I think, uh, uh, a mechanism that can be used, uh, though it's probably overused by a lot of people, uh, a as a way of engineering economic growth. Uh, there have been studies that show that unemployment spending, for example, tends to yield anywhere from, you know, a, a, a dollar to a dollar and 91 cents for every dollar that's actually paid out in benefits. And while you obviously don't want to pour too much money into that kind of spending because it becomes inflationary after a while, uh, it doesn't make any sense to reduce, to reduce those benefits to the point to where you're actually contracting uh, productivity. And of course, you, you cut benefits, you cut the social safety net too significantly, that's exactly what, what you're going to do. Uh, but my, my problem uh, comes from the fact that we just we don't have a unified view of history. You know? Uh, the rules tend to think that tax and spin policies have always worked. Conservatives tend to think that uh, that that cut cut you know cut cap and balance sort of policies have always worked too. And the truth lies somewhat in between. Now, with uh, President Kennedy, you know, he lowered the top tax rate from 90 to 71 percent or so, and that sparked economic growth. Reagan lowered taxes much more significantly, and that kicked off uh, the most. Uh, the most potent uh, economic expansion in this country's history. Clinton, on the other hand, raised taxes significantly. And under Clinton, we created actually significantly more jobs than we did under Reagan. And uh, we balanced the budget. And uh, Bush, it seemed, on the other hand, cut taxes and, 
And in people's uh, understanding of what happened, uh, we didn't have much economic activity. We didn't have much growth. And now we come to the time of Obama where Kinsey and economic policies seem to have mostly, mostly failed. But none of these, these are all simplifications, I'm saying. I'm just telling you what, what a lot of people listening to me right now probably think. Uh, the truth of the matter is that each of these contexts was a bit different but that there are certain elements that are consistent. What do I mean by that? Well, supply-side economics of the type that uh, Art Laffer uh, advocated, and Milton Friedman uh, bef before him, uh, do work, I think, to a considerable extent. I, I tend to be a bit more to the right side as far as that goes. What Reagan did worked very effectively. But people get the sense that it's because Reagan lowered taxes uh, for, for rich people that that you know, all this wealth was created. And they tend to forget that Reagan's tax cuts were, I mean, yes, the upper income people uh, saw significant tax decreases, but the middle class saw a significant tax, tax decrease over an extended period of time. And I think that that has to account for quite a bit of where the economic boom came from. There are also a bunch of other advantages to Reagan's economic situation, well, to the situation of the 80s that aren't present today that I'll have to talk about in another episode because I'll just, um, spend too much time on it. Uh, so why is it that Clinton was able to raise taxes and, and get away with having a, an, econ an economy that boomed? Well, the reason was because the economy was already booming, you know? And, and by the way, Ray, uh, Bill Clinton was right to raise taxes at that time, if you want my opinion. Uh, it's, it's the bad thing to raise taxes uh, during times of economic slowness. It's probably a good thing, particularly when you have debt and deficit to worry about, to raise taxes during, uh, during boom periods because you gain more revenue and you don't stifle growth. During the Clinton administration, you had the advent of particularly the, the, the internet boom, the dot-com bubble. It burst later on, but it powered us through the 90s. And it didn't particularly matter that Bill Clinton raised taxes from 26% back up to 39%, uh, because you just weren't going to slow down that engine of prosperity. Uh, nevertheless, part of what generated uh, the revenue that enabled us to balance the budget, ultimately, was when the Republicans, led by Newt Gingrich, came in in the, in the, the latter portion of Clinton's presidency, well, 94, you know, after he'd been in for a couple of years, and insisted that in addition to cutting federal spending, also a good thing to do during boom periods, not during weak economic times, like we have now, like the Republicans are generally suggesting we do, a uh, bit too severely, I think. But Gingrich also demanded, and the, and the Republicans also demanded, by the way, that's not, don't take that as an endorsement of, this is an endorsement of Gingrich. But they wisely said that we should cut capital gains rates. And I don't, uh, a lot of people don't know this, a lot of Democrats don't, don't know this, but throughout history, every time this country has cut the capital gains rate, uh, the tax you pay on, in, on, uh, on earnings from investments and dividends and so forth, revenue from capital gains has actually gone up. So why is that significant uh, to know? Well, it's because we're in a time now where we're in a period of weak economic growth, but the debt and the deficit are sky high, and yet we need to be productive. So I think you can do one of two things, uh, neither of which we've done as a nation, uh, and it's the fault of the president, uh, of, of, the, of the Democrats and the Republicans alike. And that is that you can either focus wholly on job creation and things that work in the area of job creation, say to hell with the debt and the deficit and just worry about it later when the economy gets better and we start producing more revenue. Or you can take what is, I think, in actuality, a truly balanced approach, not necessarily the same balanced approach that you hear people talking about now, that does things to, I think, maximize our deficit and debt reduction in the short term while maximizing our productivity in the short term as much as you can do both at the same time. What am I suggesting then? Well, on the one hand, you could either lower everybody's taxes, uh, cut the capital gains rate, and, and continue government spending. Heck, increase unemployment benefits to a certain degree if you like. Uh, not to the point of it being inflationary, but increase government spending, increase infrastructure spending, kick that off. And that's the most powerful recipe for economic growth that you'll have. Cut taxes, raise spending, and that's, that's the potent combination of growth. Of course, the, the deficit will go sky high. 
So in the long term, that might not matter if the, if the economy really gets going again, we can pay that down. But if that's too scary an idea for people, then there's another compromise you can put out there that might work politically if somebody got it. You could raise the top uh, income rates for the top, uh, for the top earners because in my opinion, when rich people make money from personal income, it's just as likely that they'll save it than spend it or invest it. Michelle Bachman says they put more money in the hands of the job creators, they'll create more jobs. That's frankly simplistic, you know, uh, simply because they might save the money. But with capital gains, the reason it always works to reduce it is because that's money that people have already put aside for investment. So they've already decided that it's worth the risk to invest in whatever project. So you lower the tax penalty on them, they invest more automatically because it's already worth it to them to do so. So why don't the Republicans and the Democrats get together? Why doesn't Obama say to Boehner or Boehner say to Obama, hey, look, let's, let's say that we can cut the capital gains rate in half and raise the top income uh, tax back from 36% from back to 39%. We'll have possibility of, of deficit and debt reduction uh, and an increase in economic activity. Uh, on, on both ends. You raise the taxes, you cut the deficit, you lower the capital gains tax, you also cut the deficit because you have growth and then you have jobs. That's a recipe for economic and political success. Apparently I'm the only one smart enough to figure that out. I just, I, I don't understand. I know, I'm, I'm a jackass. Feel free to leave me an insulting comment on the, on the screen. But that's, that's my take on it. Anyway, I'd be interested in having anybody else's opinion. So, thank you for watching.